Pullman Bay has returned home after walking 1,500 miles solo across one of the most desolate countries in the world. Ash Dykes is the first recorded person to complete the epic journey from the western border of Mongolia across the Gobi Desert to the eastern border with China. Ash, thank you so much for joining us on Newsday. Congratulations to you. You've achieved a world first. Yes, yes, and at the minute it just seems so surreal still. I really can't believe it's happened. So we've got about 1,500 miles of land ahead of me. What happens from now and then is a complete mystery. You know, we all search in our own fields for what we're truly capable of. I think mine is to test my mental and physical endurance and to challenge my limits in order to see how far I can go. Once you've passed that stage and you're now on the starting line, it's now down to you. This is the biggest expedition I've undertaken so far. 1,500 miles over the Altai Mountains, through the Gobi Desert and across the Mongolian Steppe, whilst pulling 120 kilograms. Woo! Not only the physical and mental challenge, it's also the preparation. If you're fully prepared, not much can stop you. <laughs> yes! This morning I'm feeling you know, perfect. And for the past two days there's just been no fucking shade. <laughs> From snowy mountains to hot plains. How crazy is that? It's that that gets your heart beating. And when your heart's beating, man, you're truly living. survive, there's no other option. Thank you, and luckily I did survive. So before I set out on this solo and unsupported trek across Mongolia, a lot of people told me that it just wasn't physically possible, uh, and a lot of people did think that I was pretty bonkers at the same time for which they could have quite been right. But before I talk about Mongolia, I just want to give you a bit of an overview on some of the previous expeditions that I undertook and what ultimately led me to the decision of taking on Mongolia in the first place. So before all travels and adventures began, I was studying a national diploma in outdoor education. And in between year one and year two of this course, all the rest of the students were now looking at what it was that they were going to do next. Uh, you know, some were at university, some were the military, and I was left completely confused as to what I wanted to go on to do next. For me, I found that I learned far more through experience and things for myself. So I had this idea to go traveling, but I was only 16 at the time, and I'd never boarded a plane on my own before that. But the more I thought about these travels, the more I was hooked and focused and determined to make it happen. So I thought, although it's very important to visualize me leaving the UK and making it happen, it was also important to section out, so I concentrated on the little steps. So I quit my current job uh, and started training as a lifeguard. I found work a couple of months later, and now I was earning a good income. I was doing 200 to 240 hours a month. I sold my car and bought a bicycle to cycle every day to and from work. I met a friend who also wanted to come along with me. And we thought it's all good going off and traveling, but eventually money will run out and we'll be forced to come back here. So I decided to get some qualifications that could enable me to, to work out as a, as a scuba diving instructor. 
So I was training in my open water, my advance and my rescue as a scuba diver in the hope that I could do my dive master and work abroad to maintain a steady income and obviously to, to continue the travels. So I did that and one and a half to two years later after planning and, and training and saving as much pennies as I possibly could, I left, I first went to China, which was really great. I probably indulged with the, with the locals, the culture. I was trekking the Great Wall of China. And after about a month of this, I thought, you know, I'm very much on the tourist route. I've got the same photos, the same stories, and the same experiences as every other tourist. And I wanted something different, something more wild, something more adventurous. So as I continued further down Southeast Asia, I was sulking on the Mekong River in Cambodia, saying that we spent far much money than we anticipated uh, and wanted to take on a good adventure. So I decided and said to my friend, how about we get the cheapest and nastiest bicycle that we could find and cycle Cambodia and the entire length of Vietnam. Uh, and my friend sort of laughed and said, on what bikes? And then we saw a, an old lady behind us uh, cycling a, a rusty old bicycle. So I said, perfect, well, why don't we purchase two of those, which we did. There you go. <laughs> this is Elder, and my friend's was called Dot. And as you can see, you know, it, it was under 10 pounds. It's got no gears, no suspension. It's, <laughs> it's got a, a purple bell on the front with a basket in order to carry all the snacks. We found string on the side of the road, which we used to tie a rucksack on the back. And all the locals were saying that it's just not possible to walk, uh, to cycle the length of Vietnam on those bikes, which they could have been right. What's that at the back? Oh, okay. And, uh, but we chose to go for it anyway. They also said it's not possible to cross from Cambodia to Vietnam uh, through the border without an organized and paid tour guide, but we decided to go for it anyway. We spent two minutes on Google to research the route. We found certain towns and, and cities along the way, which we'd aim for, and we left. And to be honest, it was quite a reckless cycle we had, a, we had no pump, no puncture repair kit. We spent a couple of pounds on a tent, which wasn't waterproof. And off we went, despite the locals telling us not to do it. And as you can see, you know, Vietnam's quite extreme. It was very hot, it was very mountainous, especially on a, on a bike with no gears whatsoever. We were, uh, we were chased by dogs, we were hit by mopeds, we were dodged by lorries. Uh, I found out the hard way that it's actually possible to fall asleep whilst pedaling. <laughs> and that was on a 39-hour cycle. We decided to go all the way through the day, all the way through the night and the, and the following day. But never, nevertheless, although the bicycles broke 17 times in total, we made it to the end after, after 1,130 miles. And this was the catalyst for me. I was really hooked on adventure. You know, I went against what the locals said, and, and I loved that. You know, there was lots of dangers that made me feel alive. So I couldn't stop after this, so I didn't. I ventured further down southeast. I went to Thailand, and I hopped across the border into Burma, and I learned how to survive in the jungles with a Burmese hill tribe, which was amazing what they know. Uh, I continued some more adventures around Southeast Asia, hopped over to Australia. I only lasted three months in Australia. Lack of funds, it was just too expensive for me. So I hopped back over to Asia. And this time I went over to India. I went right up north uh, and I was trekking the, the Himalayan mountain range. And this is one of very many peaks. And now it was, uh, it almost been a year and now I thought it's time to act on my previous plan, which, which was to continue the scuba diving and hopefully find work as a scuba diving instructor. So I went back to Thailand and for the next two and a half years, I trained and I was teaching people how to scuba dive. I became a master scuba diver instructor and people, I was training them from all over the world. This was practically my, my office. Uh, I was teaching people how to deep dive, how to dive through wrecks, but I've always wanted to be, uh, I've always kept myself physically fit. I've always been really competitive as well. So whilst I was doing this, I was also training and competing against the locals in the local martial art of Muay Thai. Lack of health and safety over there, it's crazy some of the kit. <laughs> uh, and although this was a great lifestyle, I felt like I was getting quite restless. It all came quite repetitive and all the previous adventures were now playing on my mind. I wanted to just quit everything and continue with the adventures. 
And this was going on for a year in my mind, so I thought, I can't ignore it anymore. I need to do something. And so I decided to get out the world map, as you do, and search at a place that I could go to next. I wanted to do a walk and not a cycle. I'd done previous cycles, so I wanted to walk, and I liked the idea of crossing remote and wild terrain, you know, pulling nothing but gear in order to survive that route. And so Mongolia instantly stood out to me, not because it was highlighted orange, because it obviously it wasn't at the time, <laughs> but as, a, as an extreme place, you know, I was on the travel route for such a long time and I hadn't come across anyone else that said that they've been to Mongolia or that they plan on going to Mongolia. It, and for me, it was just an extreme place. I knew very little about it whatsoever. So I was hooked on the idea of going to Mongolia, all on a shoestring budget. I thought, well, why don't I just cycle from Thailand, buy a bike for maybe five quid, and cycle straight up to Mongolia and then attempt the walk. So I thought, okay, let's try it. I started doing research because I thought the best thing to go about this would be see someone who's done it before, try and find them, and ask for some tips and advice. As I was, as I was doing extensive research, I couldn't find any evidence to suggest that anyone had walked solo and unsupported across Mongolia, but there was someone who attempted it, but was unfortunately evacuated after the halfway point. So I sent a message saying, can you give me any tips or advice, or you know, what are the dangers to look out for? And I got a uh, ridiculously intimidating email back, uh, and I needed to watch out for the dry wells, the stagnant water, the drunken nomadic drifters, the grey wolves, the sandstorms, the snow blizzards, and the list just went on and on. So I sort of re-evaluated the world map again and started now choosing maybe a more populated and safer place to walk across. But I thought, focus in, don't let that put you off. And so I went back to Mongolia and I thought the second best thing would be to find someone who's got extensive experience in Mongolia and I was pointed in the direction of someone who worked with the adventurists called Rob Mills. Uh, and he had got extensive experience all around Mongolia, so I thought, great. So I sent off an email asking Rob if he thinks it's possible to walk solo and support across Mongolia and if he's able to help with the logistics. And he got back with an email saying, hi, Ash, I don't think it's possible, but I'm more than happy to help. So at least I had someone on board. Rob later then became my logistics manager. And so this was, the, this was the official route. So I couldn't get too close to the borders because I was told that there's a high chance of being shot. I obviously didn't want to get shot. <laughs> so I decided to go from the most western city in Mongolia called Olgi, traverse down through the Altai Mountains, cross the Gobi Desert, and up through the Mongolian steppe, arriving at the most eastern city in Mongolia called Choibolsin. So that was the plan. Uh, and I realized now, after we both started doing extensive research, that th this was a world first. It hadn't yet been done solo and unsupported. I had to take it a lot more serious. I couldn't just get a bike and cycle to Mongolia. Uh, I took the risk to give up my life in Thailand, even though I worked so hard to get where I was. I sold all my diving kit, and I went back to the UK and moved back in with my mum and dad. And I now started surrounding myself with people who had been to Mongolia before. This is me and Rob going through some map work, planning out the route, looking at water points, looking at the food. And it was quite negative feedback that I was getting from people who had been to Mongolia before. Uh, it was a guy who had cycled 1,000 kilometers across the country, said that the horse struggled, let alone a man pulling 18 stone behind him, alone with no help. And I was getting quite a lot of this feedback. And so this is when I broke the maps down and I reevaluated the whole route and said, which one of these is the days that I fail, which is the day that really breaks me. And after we reassessed it and checked every single day as we went through, it worked out that every day was possible. There were water points along the way, there was food, I just needed to make sure I, I reached them in time. He said the biggest battle will be the mental battle. It's the third most sparsely populated country in the world. There won't be many people in between. And so I needed to really prepare for ultimately to, to motivate myself. There was no one there with me to, to motivate me. So I took that on board and I started walking the length of Wales in the dead of winter. I took trips to the Alps and would walk solo in the Alps and I was telling myself I must mentally be prepared before I physically do it. I must mentally believe it before I physically put my body through it. And I was saying if there's going to be wolves, expect to be attacked. If there's going to be snow blizzards and sandstorms, expect them to be the biggest and the baddest. Not because I wanted them to, because of course I didn't. 
But I thought, if at least it's on my mind, if I'm thinking of the worst, and if the worst was to hit, at least I'd somewhat be mentally prepared enough to hopefully plough on through. I was doing three hours a day, every day, training in my back garden, just flipping a tractor tyre, beating it with a sledgehammer to build up my inner core strength, ready to pull such a heavy load behind me. And from when the idea came to my mind about Mongolia until I acted upon it, it was only one year until I flew out with me. It was me and my trailer, which I named Elder the Incredible. <laughs> and this trailer was built in a family friend's back garden, so I was hoping it would be able to last the whole distance of Mongolia. It was all low budget. I managed to find sponsorship enough to make it happen and see me through the country. But already, I'm 80 kilometers outside the capital city of Ulaanbaatar, and this was intimidating. I was looking at this, and I said to my local logistics manager, you know, do you think I'll be facing terrain as harsh and as bad as this? And he sort of looked up to me and, and laughed and walked off, as if to say, you've seen nothing yet. And of course he was right, I hadn't. These are just hills. I was heading towards the Altai Mountains. So after, very, uh, after a three hour intimidating flight, three hours covering only three quarters of the country, uh, after seeing all the terrain that lay ahead of me and having self-doubt, self-belief, thinking who am I to come to their country with my outsider's ideas to say that I plan on walking it solo and unsupported when I've never been there before. And so um, I started to doubt myself, but I had to crack on. I told the world what I'm doing so I couldn't back out now. Until I eventually reached Olgi, the most western city. I continued through the Altai Mountains. And there was something, you know, I was anxious, I was nervous, but I was also excited. This was my baby, it was my project. And whether I succeed or fail, it's now solely down to me to make it happen. And so I continued and my lips were already chapping up. I'm over 3,000 meters high, which is already three times the height of our biggest mountain in Wales. It was cold, it was extreme. I was hit by a snow blizzard. I was told by the locals that there's wolves hunting ahead and that I'd be eaten alive. <laughs> but I, I kept focused, I plowed on through. I went eight days without seeing a single local Mongolian until the Altai mountain range was now behind me and I was nicknamed the Lonely Snow Leopard by the locals due to the wolves keeping a respectful distance from me. <laughs> I'm glad they told me after the Altai mountains and not during. And I was excited because I'd faced the cold blizzards, I was now facing the, the desert, the Gobi Desert, but there was just constant sandstorms, rainstorms, hailstorms, until eventually it settled down and it became really hot. And little did I realize at the time, this was the most dangerous part and the most life-threatening section of the expedition. The temperatures just rose massively. Uh, the terrain was pretty difficult. It was gravel, but it was also soft sand in which the tires would dig into the soft sand as I was walking across the country. And there's no shade, no natural shade from any clouds or trees, of course. There was no breeze. And I was really struggling. I slipped into heat exhaustion. I was very dehydrated. I only had a small amount of water left in which the remaining water was hot. The only shelter that I could find was underneath my trailer. And then this is when I realized and I got to the point that, you know, if I don't keep getting back out from underneath that trailer and keep pushing on, then I could quite easily die in the Gobi Desert. The next settlement was three full days away and I was unsure whether I would have made that. So I. Although it was, again, I say very important to visualize, see where you're going. When I was in this st state in such agony, I just couldn't visualize that. I had to break it down into sections like I did uh, those years ago about traveling. And so I tell myself, spend only five minutes resting under the trailer, get yourself out, strap the trailer on and continue to walk. Maybe I'd cover three, four or 500 meters before it got too much and I had to hide underneath Elder the Incredible again. So I focused on the small steps and it was just 100% agonizing and 100% pure effort to try and pull this 120 kilogram trailer through this sort of terrain and the sun was just beating down on me. But I realized I had to keep going, I had to get up no matter what and just push forward until eventually I could see the settlement now in the distance and I took this photo to realize that you know, I was extremely lucky to actually keep getting up and pushing on. Uh, I was excited, but obviously I still had a good few more hours to, to actually arrive at that settlement. Water was extremely low, but when I made it, I topped myself up full of water. I was in a lot of pain, and it took me eight days to recover 
until I started feeling about 90 to 95% confident and ready to continue. But I was determined no matter what. And as I continued with more respect and awareness to how quick the sun can take you, I eventually made it to the Mongolian steppe. And this was my home stretch now. It was a lot cooler. There was lots of wildlife. Uh, the people throughout the whole country were just some of the friendliest I've ever seen, so hospitable. Uh, there were eagles hunting, there were gazelle. I had to, of course, watch out for the snakes and the storms were the biggest here, with lightning strikes getting very close. Uh, and of course, I was pulling a metal trailer. But 1,500 miles later, taking 78 days, knocking 22 days off the predicted time, I became the first recorded person ever to walk solo and unsupported across Mongolia's landmass, losing 10 to 12 kilograms in the duration. But I guess it just sh goes to show that it doesn't matter if nobody else sees it for you. It's important that you see it for yourself. It takes me back to the Alps, that time when I said you must mentally believe that you can do it before you physically put your body through it. And I've used this motto for, for my latest expedition. Only two months ago, I returned from becoming the first recorded person ever to traverse the length of Madagascar through its interior while some in the eight highest mountains along the way. And this was incredible. I always believe in trying to help the country as much as you can, the country that you're trekking through. And so I partnered up with the Lima Network Conservation to spread awareness about Madagascar's unique biodiversity and the fact that there's over 75% of the wildlife and plant life I found nowhere else in the world, you know, Madagascar only, which is crazy. And I obviously did have the challenges and the difficulties, and only a month into the expedition, I caught the deadliest strain of malaria, and I was only hours away from slipping into a coma. It got nasty, but it took me back to the Gobi Desert, and I focused on the little steps at the time. I managed to get myself to the doctor in order for the doctor to completely eradicate malaria out of my system. And as I continued, I of course was trekking where no, no one had really trekked before. The mountains, they didn't have tracks going up. And so I had to hack my way through the bush, hack my way through the jungle. And at times it just got too much. It would mentally break me, it would physically break me. Uh, there was one time where we covered maybe 200 meters in, in a good few hours. And we had to crawl under the bamboo, try and, sc try and scramble over it. I was bitten by a spider. I was eaten alive by the mosquitoes and the leeches and I was just having a difficult time continuing until I told myself, you know, you're going to have these bad times, you've got to pick yourself back up no matter what stops you and drive on forward. So I continued through the bush, hacking my way through and I eventually made it after 155 days trekking from the most southern point, I made it to the most northern point of the island where the Indian Ocean meets the Mozambique Channel. And again, whatever dream you've got, whatever vision you've got, you're going to have setbacks, you're going to have times where you'll be knocked down. It's all about picking yourself back up and driving yourself forward no matter what. Thank you.